Glenn and I have raised our kids in this state. Our two daughters that are married and their husbands live in this state. Our grandson was born here in Kentucky and lives here in Kentucky. This state is an unbelievable gem. Some of you may have remembered, I used to have a challenge coin. It showed a little image of Kentucky on the back side. Kentucky sparkled, it almost looked a bit like an opal. And it was symbolic of the fact that this is a state that has extraordinary upside potential. It really does. And some of you have covered this state for a long time. Some of you are brand new. Many of you I don't know. But the bottom line is some of you are not from Kentucky. But like myself, those of you that have come here have come to realize this is an incredibly special place. And as we look to the future, and as we look at what's happening in the world geopolitically, we look at the demands for space and for water, for infrastructure, the state has more upside potential than probably any state in America and probably any place on planet Earth. About eight years ago, on this exact time, a couple hours before the filing deadline, eight years ago, I laid out for you all what I called a blueprint for a better Kentucky. And in that blueprint for a better Kentucky, there were seven things. You can go back and look at it. You can read it. It included things like right to work and school choice and addressing the pensions and cutting the size of government, cutting regulation, addressing prevailing wage. And we've done those things. These things were done. There's still so much more to be done. Good things are happening now, but there's so much more that needs to be done. And so I appreciate you caring about this. For some of you, it's your job. For some of you, it's an avocation. But this really matters. Today, I want to mention several things that still need to be addressed. And I appreciate the fact that some of our legislators are still here. Some have gone home for the day and for the weekend. But this is really a call out to the legislators, to the, those that have already filed in this race, to our current governor, to those of you in the media, things that need to be addressed, a couple of which I'll highlight that I hope you in the media take point on. And the first of which is JCPS. It's broken. This isn't the fault of the teachers. It's not the fault of the students. The teachers in the JPS system are literally probably on average more qualified than any of our other teachers throughout the state. They care about this. The students there are just as smart, just as capable as kids in other parts of our state. But why is it that only 35% of the kids in JCPS can read at grade level? 35%. That's based on the latest Kentucky's assessment of its own system. Only 30% of the students in JCPS are proficient in math commensurate to where they should be at grade level. The system is broken. So if it's not the teachers, and it's not the students, and it isn't, then where is the problem? The problem is in the same antiquated, broken, incompetent governance that has existed for generations. We have for generations failed these kids. It's one of the 30 largest public school systems in the country. One out of every six, six and a half kids in the state is in that system. We spend far more money per student in that system than any other one in our state. And for those of you in the media, especially of those of you that cover Jefferson County and the Louisville area, and even if you don't, you should wear this out. Wear this out. Demand better. We live in a day and age where, where impeaching is all the rage. There's a lot of it going on at the federal level, state levels, in this state, other states, etc. There's a time and a purpose for it. I don't even know what the process is for school boards. But you want to talk about impeaching? Talk about a dereliction of duty? The Jefferson County School Board, which is the same bunch of people over and over, the same tired, pathetic ideas, producing increasingly less and less results. It's an absolute failure, and it's got to be addressed. And for those of you in the fourth estate, you should be all over this, because these are your kids too, and or they were or they could be, your grandkids. 
CHFS, child welfare, the foster care system. Again, legislators, but the media as well. You should be all over this. We should not still have kids bouncing around 10, 15, 20 different homes. We have thousands of kids eligible to be adopted who want to be adopted. Why, why does it still take years for this to happen? Great strides have been made. So much more needs to be done. So much more. Put yourself in the shoes of these kids. These kids are getting screwed, basically, by the fact that so many of us are not doing what could be done. There needs to be a sense of urgency, a sense of passion, a sense of compassion for these kids. The juvenile justice system is broken. Again, how would you like to be a guard in that system? You wouldn't. It's dangerous. It's thankless. It's underpaid. Money alone isn't the solution, but the system is broken. And we're failing our society, our Kentucky. Not to mention those kids. They're not being rehabilitated. It's dangerous. It's got to be addressed. So too does our entire criminal justice system, but juvenile justice in particular has got to be addressed. We've got to look at other things in our state as well. We've got to look at our infrastructure. Actually, I'll tell you what, before I even talk about that, let me throw out a challenge to several of you as it relates to our urban communities. And we're a state that has talked for a long time about a lot of things. And I'll tell you what, where we have failed time and time again for generations is in our urban community. I'll speak specifically to the west end of Louisville, but frankly, the same thing could be said for areas in northern Kentucky, southern Kentucky, out in Lexington. Western part of Louisville, I mean, we're surrounded by major interstate highways, the Ohio River. It's one of the most prime pieces of real estate in America, literally. And it continues to be an economic desert, and it is dangerous, and there are innocent children, and some who are perhaps not as innocent, but nonetheless are being slaughtered every single week. Hundreds of people being killed in the streets, some randomly. Where are you all in covering that? Not just the sensational story, you know, a little picture of police tape and, and sirens, and, and then we forget about it. But why is this continuing to happen? These are questions we need to ask ourselves. These are things that have to be addressed. And I call out to our legislators that are in here, every one of you, no matter where you represent, but especially if you happen to represent these communities, but even if you don't, I don't care what part of the state you're from, I don't care where you report, take time to go into these communities. Don't just read about them. Don't just talk about them. Don't just think about them and pray about them, but go there and walk through there. And don't waste your time setting up prearranged visits, being led about by the self-ordained leaders of these communities, because these communities are getting worse and worse. They're not getting better. They're not getting safer. They're not becoming more economically sound at all. They're not. They're getting worse. So the people who are the leaders are not the people you need to be taking guidance from. Go in there and talk to the people who are raising children in those communities. Talk to the parents or very often the grandparents, usually the mothers and the grandmothers, that are doing their darndest to try to raise children in that environment. Talk to them. Write stories about them. Do pieces on them and keep doing them until we as Kentuckians have our conscience pricked enough to do something about it. And the people who make decisions at either end of this building have their conscience pricked enough to do something about it. It is an absolute abdication of leadership on the part of everybody that has been here for a long time. I've been a part of it. I'm speaking as much to myself. This is none of these things that I'm saying, not one of them, is going to be done by the current governor, the next governor, or probably even the next two to three governors. But they all can be done, they should be done, 
They're in the process of being done once you take that first step. And so I call out to you to make those things happen as well. If you are a legislator, drive through these communities. Go and talk to these parents. Walk into the businesses that have tried to make a living there. The corner stores, the hairdressers, whatever the case might be. Go in and ask them what they care about, what they think about, what motivates them. Those of you that are reporters, please go in, ask the people that are operating small businesses every week you should be highlighting one of them, not only their successes, but their challenges and what they're asking for. We have failed the black community in this state for a long time. And we are blessed as a state to be very demographically diverse within our urban communities, even though we're not that demographically diverse statewide. But this is our future, and this is our strength. And I will say this as it relates to what I've said in the last couple things I'll say. One of the things I would challenge our legislators to think about is this. It's easy and important to represent who you were elected by. That's true. But the reality is when there's a hole in the boat, everyone's feet are going to get wet. And we're all in the same boat. It's not a Republican boat. It's not a Democrat boat. It's not an Eastern, Western, Northern, Southern, Central boat. It is the boat of Kentucky. And we're all in it. And no matter where there is success in the state, everyone benefits. If people are rowing and the boat is moving faster, we all benefit. So these things I'm saying should be seized by everybody. Infrastructure. We are awash in money. Every state in America has billions of dollars to spend right now. Don't even get me started on the fake money, but it spends like real money, so let's spend it. Trillions of it has been printed. This is why you're paying 5, 10, 15, 20 percent more for everything. And trust me, you haven't even begun to feel it. Mark my words. We haven't felt recession. We haven't felt inflation like we are going to, because the free money is going to run out. But in the meantime, there's lots of it. And so we're building lots of things. Let's look to the future. Not just fixing things that have broken. Let's continue to repair our bridges true enough. That's great. That's imperative. It's important. It has to happen. But let's look to the future, not five years down the road, not to the next election. Let's look 50 years down the road. I challenge everyone who's in this race to steal this idea. Let's compete amongst one another for this idea. Let our current governor compete for this idea. Let any future governor compete for this idea, and that is we need to build a bypass that connects 71, 75, and the AA, period. It has to happen. And if we're smart about it, we won't do it just outside of Cincinnati. We will do it well south of that, probably halfway between Cincinnati and Louisville, somewhere in the Sparta area. I don't care where. Studies have been done. Somebody smarter than me could do another one if they want. But the reality is connecting these will afford the opportunity for demographic growth. People are looking for a place to come. Kentucky is as good or better than anyone with the infrastructure, the weather, the seasonality, the water, the opportunity. Cincinnati has nowhere else to grow except south. That's called Kentucky. Let's not do what Atlanta did by building the circle too close to the city center. Build it well south. The economic opportunity that that would create in the northern third of this state would be unbelievable. And the truth be told, everyone wins. Because when there's more people living here, more people paying taxes here, more people building things and shipping things from here, the more there will be for those in the legislature to make, legislature to make decisions and spend money on things that matter, like education and safety, opportunity. These are all, these are simple things. The last couple things I'll say are this. If we think the pension system is fixed, we're wrong. I'm talking about that because it still matters. I never brought the pension system up in the first place because I thought it would be a popular idea. Turns out it wasn't, shocker. Truth be told, it's still broken. It's still remarkably unfunded, and it's still going to fail. 
I don't wish for that. I'm just saying straight up, we owe it to our teachers, we owe it to our state police, we owe it to our other state workers who work in and around this building, in and around this town, in and around this state, who are on the highways. I saw two guys as I was driving over here hauling a deer carcass across multiple lanes of a highway, trying not to get run over themselves. We owe people like that who do jobs we don't do or want to do some sense of confidence, especially if they are under the age of 50, that they're actually going to have a retirement. And right now, and this isn't because anyone would wish it, it's not a political issue, it's not a right, left, or otherwise issue, it is a mathematical, actuarial, factual, statistical reality that the pension system as it's currently set up is going to fail. There is not enough money coming into it to maintain it, and there's no way to get more into it based on our current number of employees. There's not. And if we don't look at a real defined contribution plan for future employees, they're going to be hosed. It's that simple. That may not be a, a technical term, but I think you understand what I'm thinking on that front. The last thing I'll say is this. As it relates to taxes, I applaud our legislature, truly. The fact that we're continuing, I think Representative Reed just brought a bill, I think it came out of the House already, it's going to the Senate, to continue to bring our state income tax down. Good. It needs to happen. Absolutely. That'll bring it to four. Let's keep going. Let's accelerate foot on the gas to zero. At the end of World War II, Tennessee, Indiana, and Kentucky were all the same size. We all had the same population, plus or minus a couple hundred thousand people. Now they're both 50 plus percent bigger than us. We think we're flush with free cash from the government. They got a lot of free cash too, but guess what? They also have a lot of cash they've produced by having strong economies. I'm tired of, of Kentucky having its lunch eaten. Mark Twain once famously said, some of you know this, he said, when the end of the world comes, I want to live in Kentucky because everything arrives 20 years late. You know, that's kind of funny, but kind of not. It's also kind of true. And he said that over 100 years ago. We're 20 years behind Indiana and Tennessee right now economically. Let's catch up. Let's bring our tax rate to zero on the state income tax. But understand this, and our legislators need to understand this as well, and our people need to understand this, and you need to report this and manage expectations toward this end, and that is this. We're going to pay more for consumption tax. We can't keep our, our sales tax where it is and continue to cut our income tax. It's not going to happen. It seems like it might be possible now while there's billions of free dollars floating around, but the free dollars, the tide's going to go out and it's not going to be pretty. And so we are going to have to manage the expectations that then people can select. You want to buy a big this or a big that, you're going to pay more than the person who wants a little this or a little that. But we should have 0% income tax. Why punish the people that are producing the wealth, the people that are earning? That'll encourage companies to come here because guess what? You move a big company here from a state that has a 6, 7, 8% income tax to a state that has zero. You just gave all your employees a 6, 7, 8% pay raise the day they come in a state where it's a lot cheaper to live and the quality of life is higher and the weather is better. With all due respect to certain other states that are eating everybody's lunch right now, that rhyme with Schmorda and Schmexis, I mean, the reality is this, they're great states, but none of you really want to live there in July or August, nor do the people that are there. This state is extraordinary, great potential. The final thing I'll say is this, before I make one final comment to the others that are already in this race. As it relates to taxes, let's get rid of the stupid car tax the way it is, really? How has that not been done yet? And shame on me for not having highlighted it the last time around. It's the most ridiculous thing. It just irritates me every year. I can't be the only person that's irritated by that. People move to the state and they're like, what the heck is that? Just come up with a simple flat number, 50 bucks. Heck, I drive around in things, most of which cost 20 bucks now, so I'm in the cheap end. I'll pay the 50 bucks not to then just get nickeled and dimed on this thing with other vehicles. Just have a flat number. This is what it costs for your plates every year. 50 bucks, 75 bucks, I don't know. Any difference that that is between what we make now and what it would be with that number? I mean, you just take this and run with this. I mean, you come on now, legislators. Make it happen. People would be happy. It's simple. Final thing I'll say is this. To all those that are already in this race on the Republican side, these people are good friends. 
people who I have a lot of admiration for. And I won't name them all because, truth be told, I don't even know them all. But among those that are in, and try to do it in alphabetical order because I'm not playing favorites with any of them, but Daniel Cameron, Kelly Kraft, Mike Harmon, Alan Keck, Ryan Quarles, one of these people, you know, is familiar to you. The other ones, I literally don't even know the names of them, and I'm sure they're good people. They'll make their case. But those people that I just mentioned, I think highly of. They're already serving or have served our state and our nation in admirable ways. And my call to each of them, let's not eat each other up. Let's not tear each other up and bring each other down. Yeah, everybody wants to be the nominee, but at what cost? And I say this even as it relates to our current governor. He's not the enemy. He's not the boogeyman. His party isn't the boogeyman. For Republicans that are listening to this and that will read and watch what you guys put out there, we're all Kentuckians. Let's celebrate that fact. We're all in the boat. We're going to go faster if the boat goes faster. We're going to get our feet wet if there's a hole in the boat. It's as simple as that. I love this state. I want to see this state become the greatest version of itself that it could possibly be. And I look forward to seeing this primary unfold, this next election unfold, in the years ahead of us unfold. And I appreciate you all for listening. And now I'm going to head down the hall and I'll say this, as it relates to reading the tea leaves, Ben Goldie gets first place and Victor Puente gets uh, honorable mention. God bless you. <laughs>